Has anybody ever gotten under your skin before? Because if they have, they're right here, because this is your skin. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, and today I'm quite literally going to get under your skin. We're going to talk about the specific structures in the integumentary system, which deals with your hair, skin, and nails, and I'm going to point out the very, very important structures inside of it that give your skin all of its vital functions. So let's get right into it. First off, the skin is divided into two main regions. The top region, designated in black, is called the epidermis. Now, epi refers to upon or on top of something, and dermis literally means skin. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where it is, because right underneath it will be the dermis, the main part of the skin. And this whole region is designated in red. It contains a lot of important structures we'll talk about here in a second. And last but not least, right underneath the dermis is actually called the hypodermis. But you can probably guess it means below the dermis. The hypodermis is actually just a layer of subcutaneous fat, otherwise known as adipose tissue, and that is going to connect the skin to other underlying structures, things like bones and muscles. So those are the layers, but think about what your skin does for you. Why do you have it? Most of my students usually respond, it's for protection, right? And that's absolutely true. But protection from what? I don't see a lot of threats outside of my body, besides perhaps my dog who looks a little too hungry right now, is looking at me kind of viciously. Okay, just kidding. She's freaking adorable. But what does your skin have to protect you from? Well, basically the outside environment, which contains all sorts of things like cold air, which could actually kill you in cold enough amounts, as well as bacteria and other pathogens that could get into your bloodstream and go to all parts of your body. So I like to think of it, it's protection from everything outside of your body that exists to kill you. Now, which part of the skin actually protects you from the outside environment? Well, if you think about it, this region up here, the epidermis, is more superficial. That means it's closer to the surface. So if you're looking at your skin right now, you're actually looking at epidermal tissue. Great. Now, underneath it will be the dermis with all the other structures, but the external environment comes directly into contact with that epidermis. So that's going to be the main layer for protection from the external environment. Now we're going to talk about the epidermis in a later section, but just know for now that it has a lot of protective proteins that are going to protect it from damaging any lower region of the skin and body tissues. And we're also going to have a little bit of white blood cells in here that are going to protect us from those pathogens, the bacteria that could hop into our bodies from there. So let's instead focus on the dermis in this video. The dermis has all these beautiful structures. It almost looks like a big mosaic canvas like you might see at a church, uh, except it's underneath your skin, which is crazy. So the dermis has a lot of structures, and let's start first off with the tissue type. Now, tissues is just a collection of cells that are doing a common purpose, and most of this tissue, as you can see, kind of has all these threads. So I'm going to point at the dermis and say that this is called dense irregular connective tissue. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Well, any connective tissue has cells, and the main cells inside your dermis are going to be these little guys called fibroblasts. And as the word implies, these are blasts, which are cells that build something. And fibro means fiber. So there you have it. We have cells in here that build fibers, and these fibers, these little red strings, are called collagen. And these are protein fibers that give skin its really strong strength, elasticity, basically stretchiness, and its ability to basically snap back from where it came from. So the cells and the fibers inside the connective tissue keep your skin, quite literally, connected. Awesome. So that's going to be the main part of the skin, but there are also other structures here. Now let's start with the pink ones, because the pink ones are going to tell us a lot about a function in the skin as well. All of these guys are some sort of neurons. Now not just neurons, but sensory neurons. And these are cells that will send signals back to your brain about what's going on in the external environment. In fact, they pick up different stimuli from out here to tell your brain about it. So what types of things do we have here? Well, let's start with the easy ones. Up here, we have free nerve endings. And as you can see, they are very high up in the epidermis and dermis, and they're actually going to detect hot, cold, pain, pressure, and touch that may touch down on your skin. But usually this is more for fine touch, right? Like things brushing up against your skin. That's what's going to be picked up by the free nerve endings. But you also have these guys down here, and these are cool. They're called Pacinian corpuscles. Now, I like to think of these as like the Pacific Ocean, like really deep in the skin, because they're going to detect deep pressure. So let's say something is kind of sitting on top of you for a while, maybe even clothes, if you have pretty tight-fitted clothes. These Pacinian corpuscles are going to pick up that deep pressure that's actually being forced down from your skin. Now, the ones over here are a little more fascinating. I want to spend some time on these. These guys right here are called Meisner corpuscles. And these guys are going to require some experimentation. And to understand these guys, you need a test subject. So go find a friend or a daughter or somebody of yours, and you're going to get a paperclip. 
And with that paper clip, you're going to bend the ends so that you have two points right here, just like this. So one on the side and one on the other side. You are going to tell your partner to not look. So they're not seeing what's actually happening with paper clip. Now don't stab them, okay? Be nice. But what you're gonna do is you're going to poke them with either one or two of the prongs. Now what I want you to do is keep them relatively close together. So you're going to be touching their fingertip, press them with either one or two of the prongs, just slightly pieced apart or really close together. And you can just experiment with it. So either touch them with one or two, and you need to ask them, hey, do you feel one or two? So go ahead and do that now. Pause the video and do that either to another person or to yourself. Now let me predict what happened. Your friend was pretty good at detecting if it was two or one thing poking you, right? Especially on those fingertips. And that's because in your fingertips, you have a lot of Meissner corpuscles lining your dermis. And the more you have, the more you can determine if one, two, or three things are touching you at a time. So that's called two-point discrimination. Now here's the thing. If you do that same trick to say the back of their shoulder blades or maybe their lower back, I bet you money you can trick them. So if you have a friend or you want to do this to yourself, go ahead and poke yourself with one and then two and see if you can determine if there's one or two things poking you at your back or even the back of your shoulders. So go ahead and pause the video now. So if you did that properly, it's likely that your partner could not tell if there were multiple things touching them at a time. And that's because they have fewer of these Meissner corpuscles in the back and back of your shoulders. Now, why do you think this is important? Because structure fits function, right? Why do you think you have more of these in your fingertips, but fewer of these in your back? Well, if you think about it, it makes sense because when you are manipulating things with your fingers, you need to be able to feel what you're touching and manipulate it properly. I can't really do that with my back. <laughs> okay, so the last one is really cool here. You also have sensory neurons that are wrapped around the base of your hair follicle. So whenever your hair tilts ever so slightly, you will be able to feel it. So take that same thing and I want you to just touch one individual hair at a time. And if you do that, you will be able to feel even the slightest pull of your hair in any one direction. And this is especially important for fine touch sensation. So think about it. If a spider was crawling up on your skin, these free nerve endings in that dermal area is not going to be able to pick it up. But if it touches your hair, it'll tug on your hair and you'll be able to feel it. So all that to say, one of the main functions of your skin, sensation. So let's move on to the next part. So sticking on the hair, let's point out some structures that are also connected to your hair. This right here, it looks kind of like a muscle and it is. This is called the erector pili muscle. Now this literally stands for erection of a small pill-like structure, that pill-like structure being your hair. And this is a smooth muscle. Now what that means is you can't control it. I mean, think about it, you can't control a muscle inside of your skin, right? If you can, I am impressed and we need to study you like the specimen you are. But when do you have this muscle contracted, especially if it's attached to your hair follicle? Well, this is the muscle that actually causes the common experience of goosebumps. So whenever you're cold or maybe you're like frightened or having some emotional response, there are actually going to be signals sent to this muscle to contract the hair and pull that hair follicle up, causing goosebumps. Really fascinating. Now just a few other things here. Inside of that hair follicle, you kind of see these cells that are attached to the hair follicle kind of like this. And these are cuboidal cells, which just basically means they look like cubes. And these are cuboidal cells of what's called your sebaceous glands. And since they're glands, they're gonna have some sort of secretion or fluid that they're going to be secreting, and it's actually going to travel out and up potentially throughout the hair follicle, or it can also travel downward. Now, what do these sebaceous glands secrete? Specifically, oils. And these oils will contain different antimicrobial agents. Now, that will help in case there's bacteria or other bad things on your skin. It'll actually kill them off before they can get into your body. Now, why else would you have oils on your skin? Is mostly for lubrication and hydration. This keeps your skin, for the most part, generally moist and strong and lubricated. But if you are a teenager, you probably hate these glands. And that's because during puberty, there are a lot of hormones that will come and make an effect on those sebaceous glands and stimulate them to secrete more and more of these oils. And a lot of the times, those oils can actually seep down, like I was talking about, and begin accumulating down here, causing that very common thing of acne. And this acne is usually caused by a lot of bacteria that can get down there and make a bunch of bad products, causing your skin to kind of inflame and swell and look like the acne we all know and love. Now there's another gland in here that I want to point out. This is going to be your sweat glands. And luckily I wore a white shirt so you can't see my sweat glands working right now. But these sweat glands, the goal is to secrete mostly water but some salts onto the surface of the skin. And when that occurs, that water will evaporate and take some of your heat with it. So that heat is escaping, you actually cool off, right? So the sweat glands are a great function of your body for thermoregulation. 
So whenever your body is too warm, it'll actually sweat and it will release that heat into the atmosphere to cool you off. A great example of homeostasis, which is one of my core concepts. Now I've saved the best for last, our blood vessels. Now your blood vessels go basically to every structure of the body except your epidermis and your cornea of your eye. And this blood, the goal of it is to provide basically nutrition for all of these different cells here. So as long as the tissues of your skin are getting this blood, they will be feeding the skin properly and helping it to stay alive. That'll become a problem for the epidermal cells that get a little too far away from the blood, which we'll talk about next. Okay, I hate to interrupt this program, but I've got a dog that's on the loose, and she wants to mention if this has been helpful so far, please subscribe to Organized Biology, like this video, it's a nice thing to do, it's not boring enough to yawn, girl. But now what's interesting about the blood vessels is that they can actually dilate and constrict based on body temperature as well. So if the body gets too warm, they can actually dilate and release some heat in the atmosphere from your blood or they can constrict so you actually keep the heat inward so that you stay warm. That's just another example of thermoregulation. Now the last two functions of the skin are also vitally important but we'll touch on them in later parts of these videos. This hypodermal layer with the adipose tissue does a very important thing for your skin. It provides that insulation barrier between your skin and the underlying structures. That provides your body to stay warm and insulated underneath, as well as preventing water from escaping or even coming into your body, which you don't want to have done through your skin. And finally, you've probably heard of this before, but the epidermal layer also produces a very important hormone called vitamin D. And that's vital for a variety of cell processes like building bones and energy production. So as you can see, there's a lot of different functions for the skin corresponding with specific structures in the skin. And next up, we're going to talk specifically about the epidermis, the cells there, as well as what they do to keep your body protected from all the dangerous things of the external environment.